Hello, hello everyone. Welcome to Alibi Investigations. This is our first group training session. These are gonna spawn one-on-one -on -one mentoring sessions after this group training session, but it's great to have everyone together. We're gonna to be recording this session and please post your name and the country that you're from in the chat so people can get to know you. And if you already have a podcast, then post the link as well. Remember, you can post all this information on our Google group. Um, if you're not yet part of our Google group, we'll be sharing that link at the end of the session. The way we want to frame this is people join the Google group, they become part of our community. There are forms to fill in, which can share your investigation ideas. And then from there, we go to the group sessions, which is what we're part of now. And from there, we go to the one-on-one -on -one sessions. And hopefully the one-on-ones will really allow us to dig into your story. What's most important is that this is a community. So we want to build a powerful group of African investigative podcasters. We want you to all connect with each other. The way we've envisioned this is so journalists are the freelancers or people who work in newsrooms can connect with each other. And in turn, that will connect newsrooms. In turn, that will connect editors and managers. And we'll kind of create something not just of a community, but of a force that is really important when it comes to holding people to account. Because ultimately, we want to create more investigative journalism. And the medium that we've chosen is to do this through investigative podcasts. So we want to feel that this training is the start of something bigger. Now, at Alibi Investigations, we're passionate about investigative podcasts. And we believe that this can help distribute impactful journalism across Africa. So we've by now, all heard of podcasts, but by and large, those on the African continent are chat podcasts. So they're like people talking about politics or sport or current affairs, but they're not telling an investigative story. And what I pose to you is that this is a very good medium to get your investigations out. So if you have something complicated, if you have something deep, full of characters and insight and something that has impact, an investigative podcast series could be the medium to tell that story. So think of the people on this call, the people in this community, the people in Alibi Investigations, as the people in the future of investigative podcasts on the continent. So why investigative podcasting? So it's a way to reach people that may not have the time or the literacy to read a long investigative piece. The world is kind of going in this direction where people don't have the time or don't have the inclination because of all the other media that they can consume to read a huge long investigative piece. So podcasting is a way for people to consume while they're driving or while they're doing the washing up, many episodes of an investigative piece. It's also an opportunity for you to grow the investigative podcast scene in your country. So in, more, in some countries more than others in Africa, it's slowly getting there. But if it's not there at all, you could be a pioneer. You could be the first person that's taking this to the first level. Um, it's a way to keep a listener hooked. So we're going to talk a lot about different episodes. Now, just in the same way as you would think about watching a Netflix series that has multiple episodes that has hooks at the end of each episode, like cliffhangers, this is how we're going to start thinking about this form of journalism. So it's not just a story that you can tell in 10 minutes, um, like you might on a talk show radio segment. This is something that has depth. This is something that kind of drags a listener along week by week as you release different episodes. And by extension to that, it's a way for listeners to get into the characters and the motivations of those involved. So there is also something exciting about investigative podcasting in that it can reach your local um, audience, people that consume your um, content that you already produce on your radio, TV station or website, but it also can reach internationally. People are hungry for this kind of content and people have yet to get it out of Africa in a large amount. So you can work two audiences here. There's obviously something that we'll get into around language and around translation, but 
there is something to appeal to the people in your community in a way that you can teach them about podcasting and teach them about investigative podcasting and get them to listen to your stuff. But there's also something about getting your story heard by people that live in Europe and the US. And that's something that's really exciting. So just a little bit about me. My name is Paul McNally. I'm the executive director and founder of Alibi Investigations. You can email me at any time. So at paul at alibipodcast.com, you can get in contact with me. You can email me whenever you want. I've been an investigative journalist for 18 years. I started Citizen Justice Network at Wits University. So that's where I got my training background from. It's a project that trains community paralegals to be radio journalists. So we went into areas in South Africa and Kenya and trained community paralegals who had this legal background to be radio journalists so that they could produce important content for their local radio stations. I'm also the co-founder of podcasting company Volume, and I've produced many podcasts. I've worked on dozens of them at this point. But notably, in the investigative podcast series Game, I've produced Alibi and Too Many Enemies. And as a conversational show, I produced The Witness that was about whistleblowers in Africa. I've written a book about police corruption and drug syndicates in Johannesburg. And I started this nonprofit. So we're a nonprofit, right? Alibi Investigations. And I started it to help people turn their investigations into podcast series. And really, I can see a huge potential for growth for the medium on the continent. So the training is, like I said, is going to be a mix of group sessions like this one and also private one on one mentoring between me and you. And that's when we're really going to dig into your story. And by the end of these group training sessions and mentoring sessions, you'll have a good idea of which stories can be turned into investigative podcasts and also which ones can't. That's really important. Not every story can become a podcast, just like not every story can be a TV, uh, a piece on TV, right? You need certain things to facilitate it to be an investigative podcast. You'll be able to start scripting an investigative podcast. You'll be able to be able to conduct open-ended interviews that will be able to work to get the best audio for your podcast. So we're going to really work at how you can get the best content from the people you interview in order to assist you to get the best podcast. Um, you'll start to have skills necessary to do basic sound editing. We're going to go into different software packages. I know that's a huge stumbling block, but we've got um, free accessible software that we can teach you to use so you can be an audio editor. Um, you'll learn how to use music, voiceover, your voice. Everyone kind of hates their voice at the beginning of this kind of process. If you haven't been on radio or TV before and you don't, you're don't, you not comfortable with your voice, then we'll slowly get you comfortable with your voice. Let me tell you that you never love your own voice, um, but you do learn to live with it. Um, and also the correct equipment. Now, as you can imagine, equipment is key. We're working at getting equipment hubs set up in certain places around Africa, which you'll have access to as a member of Alibi Investigations. But we also can advise you on what equipment of your own you can use. You'll learn how to mix, master, and clean up your audio. Um, and like I'll get into later, nothing um, is better than getting clean audio straight off the bat, right? But you can do certain things in post. And you'll learn how to best promote and market your podcast. Now, this goes to what we were saying earlier in terms of marketing it for a local audience and also an international one. And those are two things that you need to kind of think about. But we want as many people to hear your podcast as possible. And I think the advantage is that hopefully this can appeal to your existing audience, but also break new ground with new audience members. So choosing the correct story. Now, the thing to do is to listen to as many investigative podcasts as possible. If you're new to the format, um, I can share some with you. You can start with Alibi, our, our flagship show, and get a sense of how this kind of thing works. Like the hooks at the end of the episodes that I was talking about, the way that um, a journalist becomes a character in a story. These are all things that are trademarks of an investigative podcast. And, you can, and the more you listen to these um, episodes and these series, the more you can kind of get a sense of what they um, consist of. The word cinematic 
is something that I kind of use a lot. And I want you to kind of feel that even though we're going to get into the necessity of being a, still being an incredible investigative journalist and still using all those tools, this is an opportunity to tell a cinematic story. Um, and I encourage you to look for a story that is cinematic, that has larger than life characters that has twists and turns because it's those twists and turns in the story, those unexpected elements, which are going to keep people listening and are going to make people listen to the next episode. Cause it's, you know, with this kind of format, you're not asking people to make one choice. You're not asking people to just choose to read your story. You're asking them to choose to tune in week after week after week to keep listening to your story. And if you're honest with yourself about what makes you do that, it's twists and turns and wondering what will happen next. It's that that's really important. Um, it also needs to be the kind of story that you are desperate to tell for as many out for many hours. And it needs to be meaty enough to justify the length of a series. Now, like I said, like not every story justifies this kind of length. And if it isn't that kind of story, then you need to like move on and find a different type of story. This kind of format lends itself to things that really demand huge amounts of time. And you are the best person to tell it, right? So you are really the person who's the most involved in the story. You're the person who knows it the best or you will do once you've researched it. But you also need to have passion to want to spend the time and effort to tell this type of story. Now, it has to have the potential for impact and to be underreported in the rest of the media. So we're really looking for stories that haven't really been told elsewhere in the media. And this is mainly because they're too, maybe the story is too complicated. Maybe it's just not really um, looked at by the mainstream media in your country. But we really want to have that like underreported element. But of course, impact is the most important. Um, your reporting needs to give you access to good quality audio and interviews. So if you have an articulate first interview with someone that's close to the story and you feel that you can interview them many times, because that's the thing about this format is often you interview people multiple times over many hours. You're asking a lot of your sources. So you're asking them to kind of give a lot of their time and hopefully in return, they benefit from having their story told in great detail. But if someone's very rushed, if they're not willing to give their time, then maybe they're not right for this story. It needs to be surprising and it needs to tell an intimate story about real people, but also talk to a wider issue that is important to all of us. And this is something that stretches right back to your sort of first day in journalism school in terms of the micro and the macro. You're telling a very intimate story about a selection of characters that's that's very close to home, right? You really want to tell that story. But with by telling this story, you're making a larger point about a trend or a problem um, that's in the society. You know, and, and when I've done stories, say, around assassinations, I've been really given good advice to stick to one story, to kind of not try and tell you know, your classic idea of feature journalism is like, okay, I'm trying to tell a story about um, wrongful convictions. I'm going to find three people who have been wrongfully convicted and jump between those three stories and then therefore cover all my bases. Maybe an old person, maybe a young person, maybe someone in between. That's not what this format is asking you to do. Basically, you need to go deep on one of those examples. You need to speak to that person in great depth, you need to find the people that are connected to them, be them family members, be their colleagues, and really unpack that story to the largest of your ability. This is not a format where you, you chop between three examples, because as you can, if we go back to the cinematic multiple episode example, if you are listening to multiple episodes, you don't want the next episode to just be a completely different story. You want to be, be sucked into the one story deeper. And that's what we've always got to be thinking about. How do we get deeper into the story at every opportunity? Um, but saying that, you need to keep in mind this larger point that you might be making about a problem. 
um, I always sort of think about when I used to do criminal justice reporting in that every criminal justice story ha is about a broken part of the criminal justice system. That's really what you're trying to highlight. But that's not the story. That's the topic. So there's that difference, um, which I'm sure you guys are all aware of, where you've got your story and you've got your topic. And um, you need to kind of balance those. Like how much time do you spend with an expert that's just talking about a topic before people get kind of bored and they don't want to just hear about um, courts and things like that. They want to get back to the story. Um, and like I said, you've got to think of your investigative podcast like a multi-part TV documentary that is told with audio. So we have two seasons of Alibi with a third busy in production. The first season was about a possible wrongful conviction. The subject's name was Anthony DeFries. So he was from Ennerdale in Johannesburg, South Africa. And when I met him, he had been in jail for 17 years and claiming to have been innocent for that entire time. And what was exciting about that case and why I sort of saw it to have legs, because that's the interesting thing about all these kind of deep investigative um, journalism stories, is that you can put an incredible amount of effort in and then you get to a point where you're like, oh, this actually doesn't work at all as a story. And you've already invested so much time. And part of you thinks like, I should just keep going. But hopefully we can advise you. And if your editor is involved, they can advise you to drop a story when it's not working. But what made me think that that anti free story really did work was that he came, or his brother came, rather, because um, he, he was holding all this material, a large sack of evidence that he claimed proved his innocence. And we had all this paperwork. We had all these photos. Some of them you'll see here at the side on the slideshow. So we had photos. We had documents. We had affidavits. We had all sorts of things. And um, that gave us the sort of confidence that Anthony wasn't trying to hide anything, because I think you know, especially if you work a lot with um, people that are in correctional services and they're claiming to be innocent, you know, everyone is claiming to be innocent, you know, and if someone's like, right, here's all my paperwork, you go through it and get back to me. They're not trying to hide anything. They're not trying to trick you in any way. And that's a good vote of confidence. Um, <laughs> there were moments in making that story where I did feel that Anthony hadn't been entirely honest with me. And during the production of that story, instead of making those points um, secret to the listener, I really lent into them. So I allowed the listener to know that this is what happened. And I made it almost a piece of drama for the story. Like, this has happened. Anthony, we think, has lied to us. What does that mean for the story? What does that mean for his case? And also, what does that mean for his innocence? And that was a new thing for me to try and do. And hopefully it paid off. Now, our second season was about the assassination of a high school teacher called Priscilla. Now, she was killed in front of her class, right, in the surrounds of Durban and KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa. Now, it was horrendous. She's like busy at the blackboard um, teaching her class and two men um, come in and shoot her with 19 bullets in front of all these students that are all witnesses. Uh, uh, no, no, no arrests are made. Very little investigation is done by the police. I come into it about a year after um, it has happened and still very little has been done. Now, the key to that story, which I think is an important lesson in, in this kind of production, is that I managed to find Seer. Um, who was a student who witnessed that murder, and his father, who was a cop, a local cop, who was on the side, not as part of his job, but on the side, was trying to solve that case. And that's an incredibly um, relatable uh, piece of the story in otherwise an unrelatable tragedy, right? You've got this incredibly horrific murder, um, and that, that's the problem when you're dealing with something like an assassination, is that the main um, character, Priscilla, is dead, right, at the start of the story. You can speak to her family, who are very, understandably very upset. You can speak to those people around, but but in terms of trying to solve the case, it's very difficult um, when you don't, like, say, 
on the first example where you've got a wrongful a possible wrongful conviction you can at least talk to the person who's in prison um but finding seer and his father who were you know his father was bringing home mugshots to his son every night and asking him to pick who he thought was the assassin you know that's powerful stuff that and their journey of trying to solve this case ultimately became the story of the podcast. So even though it's about an assassination and, and like to my point earlier, the macro idea to the larger idea of assassinations, it's about in the country and um, to the continent, but it's the, the intimate part of it is this young boy, young man and his father who are desperate to kind of get some catharsis. Cause I mean, Sia was incredibly traumatized by witnessing this as you can imagine. And he felt that if he managed to find the killer and find the person who ordered the killing, you know, right? Because obviously in any assassination case, you've got these assassins who are just paid, you know, and you need to find the person who's paid them. Um, he found that if he, if just by going through that and trying to figure that out for himself, he was trying to, he was getting some kind of catharsis. Okay, so like I said earlier, you still need to be an investigative journalist in this format. Um, so even though it's a podcast, you have to follow the rules. You know, you have to protect your sources, even though it's audio. If you if you're used to doing it in print, um, some people might not want to be recorded. Um, you can. We've done this in the past on certain seasons and interviews. We've hidden people's voices, made them kind of sound mechanical. Um, but sometimes people don't even want that. So. We've also done things where we've not recorded anything and you just have to narrate what has been said. Um, you have to give good right of reply and you have to make sure your facts are accurate and verified. You know, it is very tempting when you're telling a story that focuses on character and interviews um, just to take everything on board that people are telling you. But just like every other journalism medium you need to make sure that what you what people are telling you is fact um and then a piece of advice that was told to me many years ago that i i find really uh, beneficial for this kind of reporting is to report against your story because it's so easy um to take a certain type of route that's like say it's a possible wrongful conviction to immediately assume that the person who's speaking to you is is telling you the truth and they have been wrongfully convicted, and that's the story. And that's the story you want, right? Um, but it's so much more powerful if you try at every turn to report against that story. So you're trying to not prove that he's innocent, you're trying to prove that he's guilty. And um, that can get the best results. It, can, it, it also kind of really um, pressure tests your story in a way that can create good drama in itself. Because, and we'll get into this later, you are a character in this story, you know, as a journalist in this kind of investigative podcast medium. You are telling the story. It's your voice. It's your passion. And ultimately, you finding out facts and you finding out things that are important to the story is going to what keeps is, is going to be what keeps a listener interested. OK, so collecting audio in the field now. You need to collect audio that will immerse the listener in a scene. You need to get your microphone. Um, if it's a digital recorder, if it's a microphone, if it's just your smartphone into the environment where you're recording. So recently I was working on a story um, in Durban where there was these incredible floods. Um, people's houses had been destroyed. It was awful. And um, I really had to remind myself to really get the audio that was necessary to paint the picture of these floods because you can describe them um but you also want the sound of the rain you want the sound of the water you want the sound of the people treading in the mud um and that's not always uh um something that you remember when you're faced with some kind of tragedy right you're not trying to you're not being as calculated it's like oh yeah i must get some some audio of the water but you have to try and bring yourself out of the emotion of it, um, at least for a few seconds, to record that audio. Because you can't, it's not, if you're used to doing something in print, you can't just describe everything. You need to record everything all the time. You know, people that 
um, have been on these kind of trips before will, rem will know that the moment you turn off your recorder, something will happen. You know, before you get out of your car um, to go to the field, you need to rec be recording. You know, everything needs to be recording all the time. It's, it's a pain because you'll have so much tape, um, but it will be worth it. Now, you might feel you want to narrate an incident as it happens. So like on this example, when I went to the floods, I was sort of climbing around and kind of getting out of breath. And um, I did some moments where I was narrating into my recorder. This is what I'm seeing. And it is, it is kind of effective. It is effective more than when I you just record voiceover at a later stage in a studio. You're kind of telling what is happening um, and they're getting your emotion from it, especially if you're looking at something that's a, a tragedy. But it's better to ask someone else, one of your characters, to do this instead. So you get their perspective. Because that's what you're trying to get with this kind of podcasting medium, is you're trying to get people's voices. You're trying to get different voices, different perspectives. So rather than you just saying, because remember, you have control over the detail in your voiceover. You're going to add voiceover in. You can do that for as much as you want. But to get someone who's right there, who's maybe lives in the area, their perspective, what it, and you might ask some kind of strange questions that they might think is strange, like, please describe to me what you what we're looking at. And they're kind of wondering, why do you need me to do that? But you need to get as much detail from someone as possible. And that might entail asking kind of strange questions like what are we looking at even though they know that you know like what has happened here even though they know you know what has happened here but you're trying to get as much atmospheric detail as possible okay so we're going to get really into the equipment that you are using and you know what you have in our one-on-one -on -one sessions and a lot of this has got to do with budget Obviously, a lot of this has got to do just with your own personal taste. Like some people like some brands more than others, but you need a digital audio recorder or a smartphone. But I would, we're going to try and work at trying to get people digital audio recorders, at least to borrow in certain instances. Extra mics, like a shotgun mic, really makes a huge difference. Lapel mics are expensive, but those are the ones that you just clip to your, clip to your source's um, shirt. Headphones are an important accessory. You know, especially if you're using an audio recorder, you might seem a little bit um, ridiculous, like walking around. You don't need huge headphones like this to walk around with, but maybe just small inner ear ones, but it will help you know what is, what is being recorded and if there's any problems, because there's nothing worse than spending a day recording and you come back and like something hasn't recorded properly, something hasn't worked. Okay, so when you're interviewing, Let's go first into sound um, quality. So when doing an interview with the source, make sure that the environment around you is as quiet as possible. That might seem like an obvious thing, but when you're when I'm talking about atmosphere, when I'm talking about trying to get the feeling of an interview, that should not be at the sacrifice of sound quality, right? So if you want atmospheric sound, like if you're doing something on a construction site, a story is on a construction site and you want the sound of drilling rather do the interview in a quiet place away from the drilling and then go and record on a separate track the drilling and then you can bring the drilling in if you want to to create an atmosphere don't feel don't be mistaken to think that a listener really wants to hear something like drilling because it's relevant to the story. They would rather hear an interview that is clean. They'd rather hear an interview that is quiet as possible, apart from the people speaking. Um, and because you are going to be um, a character in this podcast, right? And we'll talk a little bit later as if maybe you'll decide not to do this. But I think most people will put themselves as a journalist, as a character who's like a like an in private investigator. You know, you're uncovering pieces of the story. Then don't be afraid to put you into the interviews as well and be sure to get good sound quality for that so you want to bring your recorder back to you when you're asking that question so it's not off what we call off mic you want to get as much of that recording as possible of yourself um there's also the challenge with remote recordings now we're kind of used to that we're doing this on a on zoom this um training but 
doing remote recordings, even though we're used to them more so than we were um, because of the pandemic, and there's different software we use, Riverside, which we found is the best um, software to use to improve the quality, it still is difficult over a computer to get people to open up, even if they've spoken to you before. So even if someone, if you have a relationship with them and you've spoken to them, I mean, you can think about that. I mean, it's obvious, right? In a comparison to like talking to your friends over Zoom, it's different from meeting up with them in a coffee shop for a drink. Um, so we warn against stories that will require you to do a lot of work over the computer even though it's so tempting now, right? Post pandemic, we're like, right, you can do a story from anywhere. This is the new way of doing journalism. The difficulty is, is if you're doing anything sensitive, people um, get very, still get very suspicious of doing stuff over the over Zoom. And um, even if they say they're willing to speak, they often won't open up in a way that's got texture. You know, so when I, um, the story that I'm busy working on, a lot of, the interviews I'm doing are unfortunately having to be done over Zoom. And then when you go back to listen to them, they all sound like they've been done in the same place. You don't get that sense of like, oh, that was when I went to that person's office. That was when I went to that, um, to, to a coffee shop with that person. And they, and even though you're trying to get, like I said, like very high quality, clean sound, you still get a little bit of texture. If everything's done over the computer, it sounds like everyone was recorded in the same place. I know it's something that we can't always avoid, but um, don't be tricked into thinking we now live in a world where everything can be done over Zoom. Okay, so the content of your interviews. Like I said, you want people to describe things as much as possible, um, but you also wanna ask them how they feel. Now, this might be a question that you're not used to asking. Um, and also it's definitely a question that a lot of people are not used to um, having posed to them um, by a journalist and you might, want to do this even for people that have not had um, horrific things happen to them. Like what I find is very powerful is even the people that you're just going to ask for comment, right? And if you're um, something's happened, you've got a government official or a police officer or a spokesperson or something like that, and you want them to comment on what's happened in your story. This is also an opportunity of what we'll get into later of a scene a scene of you going to a police station, a scene of you revealing what a police station is like, um, the functioning of a police station to people that might not know that. And this can be small details. You don't have to derail the whole story for that, but it gives people an insight into your city, into your country, into, that, into the workings of a police station. And if you ask your um, police spokesperson a few more questions, about themselves, about their background. Maybe they'll, they won't they will want to answer them and they'll tell you to get lost. But if you get that, then it adds a lot of texture to the kinds of people that are dealing with your story's content, right? Like, especially if you're doing criminal justice, like I find that like people often cannot visualize what it's like um, for the court system. Right. And to give a sense of the paperwork, the bureaucracy, the people working there, all that sort of stuff, even though the courts are a bad example, because often you can't record in courts. But um, but as long as it's um, out in the open and you're recording and people are aware of it, there is definitely there is always an opportunity to reveal a little bit of a detail about your society, about your story through um, every moment. So if they say like they stop for lunch then you ask them to tell you exactly what they ate. And you might not use that actual tape. You might bring it out and put it in voiceover. You're trying to build a very um, detailed description of everything that happens. And that's what builds a good story, right? That's what keeps you involved, like knowing about, even if it's just someone who's offering comment, like kind of getting a sense into their lives makes you more interested in and makes, makes you wonder why they're giving the comment that they're giving. If every interview in this kind of format, try not to be rushed. You're not working to a next day deadline, it's long form. Be prepared to interview them multiple times for a very long period and kind of let them know that you're taking your time with it. Okay, so this is something else that when I was putting this together really made me think of, and that's the important use of time. 
Now, the important use of podcasting is the fact that it's linear, right? So largely, people won't go back and check again if they haven't understood something. They'll probably just kind of zone out, kind of stop listening. If you lose them in any way while they're listening, they're kind of, you've kind of lost them. They're not coming back. Um, you might be able to pick, they might pick back up a, a next sort of stage or something like that. But the thing about these types, these types of stories is one thing builds on the next thing, builds on the next thing. So if you get, if people get confused, then they're kind of going to turn off and not listen. However, the advantage of things being linear is that the story keeps moving. It can't be stopped, right? Unless they physically stop the audio. So you can use this time by setting up narrative questions for this listener about the story. Now, a classic example that I, I didn't make up, but Ira Glass from This American Life kind of always uses when he explains this is that a man wakes up and the house is too quiet. Now, you don't know anything about this man other than that he's just woken up. But that, I, that detail that it's too quiet makes you as the listener immediately wonder why. Why is it too quiet? You immediately want to know this. And you are, the story has only been going for a few seconds. Um, so while the listener waits for an answer, that builds tension. And that's what you're trying to do. That's what keeps people listening, this tension, right? So this tension of questions being posed and not answered. Now, if you drag this out too long, people forget what the question is. They forget that the house is too quiet. They get bored and frustrated. So you need to be tactical in asking these questions and then answering them, right? Now, that might seem easy when you're just doing the example of a man waking up and the house is too quiet, but you can do this with your journalism. So you have questions open to the listener, and these can be big, like, did he commit the murder? Is he innocent or not? Like, that's a huge, big question that you're, you can kind of keep dipping into over the course of your investigative series. Or it can be a small question, like where will he find that document? So it can be an example where we need to find a court document, where can we find it? And immediately the listener is with you wondering, where can we get this document from? So this constant question, questioning and answering pulls you through the story. And, um, that's what you can really take advantage of, this tension building. So now you can move on to what are your story's main points. Now you can kind of think of your whole investigative series like it's a puzzle, right? So what is the macro uh, one-line pitch? And what is the macro greater societal story? Like what I got into earlier in that this is about a single assassination and the macro like societal story is this is about assassinations in general and how the economy of violence is getting worse in the whole country and et cetera, et cetera. So you've got these micro and macro working alongside each other. But for this kind of um, journalism, you want to be asking who are your main characters, right? So what are the main themes of your episodes and what are the main scenes within each episode? Right. So when I talk about scenes, it's true that you're kind of thinking, like I said, cinematically, a scene is you um, enter an office, you talk to someone in that office, they give you a piece of information, and then you decide what you're going to do with that information and you leave the office. That's a scene. Right. And the best way to kind of convey information in an investigative podcast series is to do it within scenes. So everything kind of falls within certain scenes within your episode. But what's also crucial is the ending and what you are aiming for. And essentially this is what the story is building towards. And this gets to the point where you've got to try and decide what ending, your, uh, what ending is possible and what ending you will be happy with, right? Because there is a perfect ending to every story, especially a narrative, driven investigative podcast. So for example, if it's a possible wrongful conviction, the fact that he is proved to be innocent and gets and you get him out of jail, right? That's an amazing ending to that story. The chances of that happening, every everyone knows, is very slim. Even the listener knows that, but they want it to happen. And 
they're going to be disappointed if they don't get their the ending that they want right so it's up to you to try and work with expectations of what they can expect from a good ending right so for example when we did the assassination story with priscilla we wanted to find the person who had ordered the hit. We wanted proof of the person that had ordered the hit. And it came out that it was actually, um, the, it was rumored that it was the um, other teachers at the school that had ordered the hit, right? So they had ordered the hit in order to get her job. That's what was kind of going around. It had been very openly discussed at PTA meetings. And actually some of the teachers had been singled out as people that had ordered this hit. Now, there was a version of that story, and, and it, that was fantastical to me. That idea that there are teachers that are ordering hits on other teachers in order to get their job just seemed insane. Now, we didn't find well, a perfect ending would have been like we found proof of that and we managed to get someone, uh, and that proof led to a police investigation that got someone convicted. Okay, that's your perfect ending. We didn't get that. So we'd decided that what would be a reasonable ending that we could live with would be an interview with one of these teachers that had been accused of ordering the hit, right? And that's what we got. So we got this interview with one of the teachers. I sat in my car. I was terrified, actually. I mean, this was this middle-aged, um, very frail woman, uh, you know, and I've interviewed huge gang members and all sorts of things like that. But no one really scared me more than this frail middle-aged woman because I kind of believed that she had ordered this hit on, on her colleague. And we interviewed her about it. We interviewed how the accusations had ruined her life. We, and we left it up to the listener to make a decision based on the interview that we did um, if she was guilty or not, right? So that wasn't, there was a, uh, people were happy with that ending. And we were, I was ultimately satisfied with that ending, but it wasn't, as I sort of pointed out, the perfect ending. And you need to kind of, and that is constantly a moving target, right? So more so than maybe other forms of journalism, um, the ending really matters. Where like sometimes stories will just end with a comment from the person in power and they'll say no comment, the end. That's not this kind of journalism. We're looking for resolution. We're looking for an ending that kind of ties everything together and brings your story to a close in a way that is satisfying. But you can decide what is satisfying and what isn't. And you also need to work with what you're given, right? You can't just make stuff up, you know, and um, no one's really asking you to do that, but they still want it to be satisfying. Okay, so scripting, I always say scripting is the most important part of this process. So you need to write with as few words as possible, but in a way that sounds natural for your voice. Okay, so you need it to be, um, and I often, what I do is I will write a script, and I'm quite used to how I speak now, but I will write a script, and then I will voice that script into my phone, um, and as I'm voicing it into my phone, I can hear the points where I haven't really got it right for my own voice, and then I will go back to the document and correct that. So, you know, you want it, you're trying to use as few words as possible, but what's important is that someone else can't really script for you, um, your, your, at least your parts, because you know your voice better than anyone, and you're trying to get it to sound as natural in your voice, in, in your mouth as possible. If it's a word that you, that you would never use, don't use it, right? Because that will sound unnatural. Don't be afraid to fully describe the places and people in your story. So like that old writing idea, write with all your senses. What did a place smell like, right? You might not be used to using those kinds of things in your journalism, but it really makes a difference, especially when you've got the audio, like I was saying, of running water and there's been a flood. What does it smell like there? That's something that the audio and can't pick up. So your description will really make it powerful. And write like you're telling the greatest story of your life. Don't hold back, right? If it's a part that you think needs more work, then research it. If it's a part that you think is boring, cut it out. It's as simple as that. But always be looking to the future. Like I was saying, in your writing, this is where this happens, right? This idea of setting up um, questions um, and answering them, it comes in your writing. 
always be conscious of what questions the listener is asking him or herself um, about your story and kind of play along with that. If a section is a huge tangent, so if you're writing it and you're in a scene and um, something kind of comes up that you really think will confuse or diffuse the tension. So you've got this tension, um, but you now you're going to start talking about some kind of history or something like that or another character or something like that. Cut it out and flag it as something you will come back to later. So you can literally say the words, we will come back to this at a later stage. Because listeners like to know that there is more to come and that there's something to look forward to. And they like the idea that you are telling, you've got a handle on the story, right? That you know that there are bits coming up later that you will that you will reveal at a time that is most prescient for the story. I've kind of touched on this before, but confusion is your enemy. Interject with voiceover and explain what a source is saying if it is important. So th this might be the name of a place, the name of a person, the name of something technical. If you feel that it needs to be in the story, um, then and you think that the listener won't understand it, then you need to cut in and explain that. You can't just let minutes of an interview roll by um, where someone might be talking about something that the in the, the listener isn't entirely a hundred percent sure of what's going on um and that's kind of different from like talk radio where a lot where that cat is allowed to happen quite a lot here we're controlling line by line um what is being said and we're making sure that the listener really knows what's going on and what the details that are being revealed we know that they know the context of it and to get this is to ask people to read other people to read your scripts and listen to your audio to make sure they understand um, what you're trying to say because you are deep into your story you might not know which bits confuse people you might not know which bits need to be explained because for you everything you take for granted of course you know who that person is of course you know about that of course you know about this you need to really get other people not just your colleagues not just other people that are a part maybe know about the story pick family members who have no idea what you do for a living get them to listen to it if they are intrigued and pulled in then you've won everyone over right um i can't reiterate enough that you've got to think in scenes like a movie and think about how bits of evidence lead to the next bit of evidence so it's almost like someone swinging in a forest um and always be clear about your goal for the series as a, as a larger thing, the episode and the scene. A good tip that someone gave me was that you should take photographs in the field. So you're right, you might write things down, but sometimes you've got like an you got your microphone, you're recording things, you're talking to people, take photos on your phone, and then that will help you when you get back, um, write what what you've seen you know because you might forget you know so to take as many photos as possible really helps um, and like i said to record dummy voiceover can really help as well so editing your series um is a huge task right you need to take time to listen to your audio repeatedly um, and ultimately what you're doing is you're searching for the best clips from your interviews to mix with your voiceover and tell a story like for those of you that have used Adobe Audition or Pro Tools and you've seen those, those uh, you know, a recording uh, piece of software it can look quite intimidating for those who haven't used it. It's just all different colors, it's all different clips, but you get used to it and we can really acclimatize you to it. And it isn't actually as complicated as you think it is, um, but the edit is important and you need to listen to other podcasts to take note as how they are edited. So what are the transitions like? Is there a fade in, fade out? Where is music coming in? Where is atmospheric sound? Like I said, like the sound of, of rain or water dripping, where is that coming in? Think of it as a camera that's moving through your story. Um, you don't want silent patches, obviously, but you do want to give your audio space to breathe. And when I say that, you need to know where your impactful points are. So you kind of give them time, maybe a little bit of music, maybe just a moment 
for the listener to absorb what has been said before you jump to the next point. Um, what's important with the edit is you always want to be looking at ways to change what your listener is hearing. Also, you don't want tiny, really short clips because they might not know, a, a listener might not know um, what they've just heard. But ultimately, you don't want to be sticking on one voice or one thing for too long because people get bored. You know, it's not talk radio. You haven't got the ads and things coming in. You've just got the story. And you need to feel that the listener needs to feel that you're constantly in control of giving them the most appropriate piece of audio at any given time. Okay, so hosting, I've kind of touched on this before that you are a character in your investigative podcast series, right? Mm -hmm. And your journey through the investigation can be a good guide for your listener. Um, you know, as you discover facts, then so do they, right? But also there's another crucial part to this is when you express emotion in your voice, then your listener relates and will also feel that emotion, right? So you might be surprised at finding something out. You might be betrayed by someone lying to you. Then the listener will also feel that. Now, there is an ethical debate to be had about this in terms of journalism, and I'm totally willing to have that debate. And you can decide how human you want to be in your voiceover, right? And human, I say, like if you want to sound like the almost the kind of BBC um, kind of prim and proper voiceover, or you want to sound more human. Um, I don't have anything against the BBC, but I, you know what I mean. Um, then that's something that you can decide on. But I would strongly suggest that you make use of your voice as an instrument. You make use of your character as a character in the series. You know, even to the extent where you, if there are any personal traits in your life or history that relate you to the place, the people, the story that you're telling, I would bring those up. Not in a huge way, not in a crazy way, but just in a, uh, like if someone in your family had been assassinated and you were doing an assassination story, I would bring I would bring that into the story to make the fact that you have more investment in the story. Because the more investment you have as the main um, narrator, host, and journalist in an investigative podcast series, then the more investment your listener will have as well. Okay, so studio recording. Now, you need a studio or a quiet place to record your voiceover. But the pandemic kind of taught us that you can um, use all manners of cupboards, clothes. You know, if you've got a cupboard full of clothes that I've got here, you can get good sound. It's not impossible. But a studio is first prize. Um, you want to speak in a relaxed but expressive voice. It's almost like it was described to me once, like you're playing yourself as a character um, on stage. Right. And that's kind of that's not just how you're not just how you are all the time. You're you, but with a little bit more expression, a little bit more heightened emotion. You need to use a pop filter when you hear podcasts where people haven't used pop filters and it's popping. You know, you'll know that popping sound. It, it, it drives me crazy. You need to use a pop filter. You need to make sure that it works. And when you're doing your voiceover, you need to take breaks. Um, you might not notice, but your voice will get strained. And what you want with this kind of production is you want consistency. So you want your voice to always sound the same in voiceover. You want the microphone you're using to be the same. You want the area that you're recording in to be the same. Consistency in some ways is more important than um, quality, even though quality is important. But you need everything to be the same in every recording session and you need to take breaks so it's not always, so you don't just do it all in one go. In the last episode, you sound like your voice is all destroyed and at the beginning you sound fine. Okay, so studio equipment, you need computers, you need internet, you need microphone. Um, we can talk as well about soundproofing. Um, like I mentioned the cupboard, um, but there are other ways on how you can soundproof your environment to get good voiceover. Um, now, using music, I wanted to talk a little bit about how music is a very powerful tool. Now, people, uh, journalists and executive producers I know, don't like the use of music um, in broadcast journalism. 
So like if they're producing a TV show, um, then they won't allow music, their journalists to use music. And I understand that argument, right? Um, I understand it because it's it can kind of be construed as manipulative. They can be kind of construed as a bias, I guess, which isn't journalistically sound. Now, I do think that you, if you overly use music, you can destroy your investigative podcast, right? But I do think it's okay to use it to enhance the emotion that you want your listeners to feel, right? Um, but use it carefully. Um, you don't want music to play all the time. You want to use it sparingly. And you need to be okay, right? This isn't, if you're from a more traditional radio background, you might feel that you need to put music behind everything, but be okay with patches of people just speaking. That's also okay, right? That's what people are used to when they're listening to a podcast. They're okay with just speaking. You're bringing in music to give a breather, like I said, to emphasize a point, to give like a space where you're like, okay, we're moving on to the next scene or the next part of this story, or you're using it in order to underline or emphasize a certain type of emotion. Now you can look for music for free at music at freemusicarchive.org or on YouTube. Um, there's a good program that can convert a YouTube video into an MP3. And what's great is you can build a library of music for your series. So it's almost like you have themes that you play when a, when an emotion or a moment repeats itself. So if something is really um, frustrating for your main character, you might play a certain type of music. Then in the third, ep a couple of episodes later, in the third episode, something frustrating might happen again. You can play the same type of music. And this helps with the kind of world building that you're trying to do for your series. Okay, so you can spend a lot of time or a little time mixing and mastering and cleaning your series. And it also depends on your skill level. But what you do want to do is make sure that the audio levels across your different clips are consistent. So, you know, you'll know that from hearing. You don't want really high parts which make you turn the volume down and really low parts that make you turn the volume up. You know, you want to try and get them as consistent as possible. You can use programs like Isotope RX to clean background sound. But like I said earlier, these programs are not magic. So you rather want to record the cleanest sound when at first at the beginning um, and not to think like, oh, I'll just fix it later because you can't really fix everything later, right? And nothing beats getting clean sound at the outset. Um, you need to pay attention to the loudness of your episodes. And also what's a key thing is you can listen to your episodes on different devices. So in different environments, so not just on your headphones from your computer, but also on your phone, on the speaker of your phone, on your ear pods, in your car. This is how you'll get closer to your audience, because this is how they're listening to your podcast. So if it sounds, if you, you know, if there's certain types of clips or audio that you can only hear on very good headphones on your computer, you need to rethink that piece of audio, because by and large, people are going to be listening to it on their, on their phone, probably. So you need to, that's also a good tip. And it also can help with editing to kind of just get away from your computer. Listening, I find listening to an episode edit in a completely different space on a different format really allows me to hear um, problems that I wouldn't hear if I was just sat at my computer. Okay, so like when we were talking earlier about the need for good research and accuracy, you also need to check like any kind of journalism with editors and lawyers. Um, it's important to know when you might be sued. You want to know, you want to be prepared for that. Um, like any lawyer will tell you, they can't make you not get sued, right? Because people can sue you even if, uh, but what they're trying to do when they give you advice is that they're trying to uh, make sure you win when you get sued, it gets dismissed. So the last series that I worked on, Too Many Enemies, which was also an assassination case, we went through a rigorous lawyer process because there was, um, accusations towards top politicians being linked to the assassination and, and all that kind of stuff. It was quite a very meaty story. Um, and we didn't get sued, thank goodness. Um, but also we cut large sections out. And the thing that I was reminded of when I did that was that no one knows how great the story was before you made those cuts, but you. You need to let that go. So in my mind, I'm like, oh, this story is terrible now because we lost this whole section. No one knew about that but me, right? So, you know, 
the story isn't as good, right? You've got to make peace with that. And that's true. The story is not as good after you make those cuts that the lawyer makes you cut, but you don't want to get sued and it's not worth it. Like you should really, you have to, I, I don't know what the instance would be where you wouldn't take a lawyer's advice um, to make a cut, but you really, uh, I would strongly advise if they give you um, any kind of reason to make a cut, then you either go back and do more research or, um, you know, verify a piece of information so it holds up more than it, than it is already. Maybe that's one way um, or just cut it. That's basically it. I mean, you really don't want to be in a situation where a lawyer told you to cut something, you kept it in and then you got sued. So we're going to be conducting risk assessments and safety protocols on your stories. So we've partnered with the committee to protect journalists, and they've offered to check out your stories uh, and yourself, right? So this is something that I've struggled with my whole career in terms of risk, in terms of not really knowing, because like any journalist, you want to do the story, right? You don't want to be told that you can't do the story, especially because of risk. But we find that it's very important, especially in the, there's an in increase in the world of um, attacks on journalists. And we don't want to be pushing people into situations where they're covering stories, where there's a high risk um, threshold that they haven't considered, right? So part of that might have to do with there was something that was suggested to us in that there would always be someone that would take over a story from a journalist if they stopped doing it. And that, to me, feels like a very sensible way to kind of shout back to people that might attack journalists to be like, no matter who you strike down, the story will prevail. And I, I find that that's quite exciting. But we are going to get into that. We're going to get into the risk assessment of things Um like just like with the legal side of things, like I've been in situations where I've been very glad that I've cut certain things because I felt that they were too risky in order to publish um, for my own personal safety. And I've never really regretted that when I've kind of erred on that. I've kind of, it's kind of upset me for a few days, but ultimately I've been very glad. Okay, so promoting your series. Now, this can be a whole business in itself. You've got to choose your hosting platform. We'll help you do that. Captivate, Iono, Afropods, you upload it. You register it with all the platforms. So like things like Spotify and iTunes, they're really just directories that will kind of show where your podcast is and give people the opportunity to listen to it. We also would suggest if podcasting is not a huge thing in your country to partner with a local radio station in order to get the show broadcast or just clips of the show of the podcast broadcast. You can look to large websites. We did a last series with News24 in South Africa to help you with distribution. So they can help embed the audio. They take the audio for free often. They won't pay for it, but that will help often with big distribution deals. Um, what can really help is for you to appear on other podcasts as a guest in order to promote the series. So if you promote the series as a guest and then, you know, you can kind of get the word out there in the podcast um, ecosystem. Use social media, of course, but what we have found is people rarely click through on social media. So it really just works as a billboard, which is useful, but it's when people are scrolling Twitter, they are not in the habit of now listening to a podcast. So they might see it on Twitter and then go to their podcasting app and search for it there. That's why you need to make sure you're registered with all these um, directories like iTunes, but they're probably not gonna click straight through from a tweet. So don't be discouraged when you see the lack of traffic and engagement from your social media posts. Okay, so next is the one-on-one -on -one mentoring, okay? So this is just the start, these group training sessions. We're gonna be doing them every month, um, but the next step is to book a training session one-on-one -on -one with me in this calendar app that I'm gonna send the link to now. Um, we'll talk about your story in detail and what it will take to turn it into an investigative podcast series. So that's where you book the training session. Um, if you'd like a virtual certificate for this training session, please get in contact with me and I'll send you one. You can email me anytime at paulalibipodcast.com. Follow us on Twitter. And also if there are any other working African journalists that you want 
uh, to join our community, please point them to our Google group and get them to sign up. That's how we're going to build this community. That's how we're going to do something extraordinary with all of you working together. But thank you very much for listening and goodbye.